Hello, Nick Sal here. Welcome back. We are reading The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. This is a dramatic reading of The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. And we are taking you to chapter two, where our character Brian has just realized he's alone, soaring through the air on this bush plane, and he doesn't know how to fly. Chapter two. For a time that he could not understand, Brian could do nothing. Even after his mind began working and he could see what had happened, he could do nothing. It was as if his hands and arms were lead. Then he looked for ways for it not to have happened. Be asleep, his mind screamed at the pilot. Just be asleep. Oh my goodness, so sorry. His mind screamed at the pilot. Just be asleep and your eyes will open now and your hands will take the controls and your feet will move to the pedals but it did not happen. The pilot did not move, except that his head rolled on a neck impossibly loose as the plane hit a small bit of turbulence. The plane. Somehow the plane was still flying. Seconds had passed, nearly a minute, and the plane flew on as if nothing had happened. And he had to do something, had to do something, but he did not know what. Help. He had to help. He stretched one hand toward the pilot, saw his fingers were trembling, and he touched the pilot on the chest. He did not know what to do. He knew there were procedures that you could do mouth-to-mouth on victims of heart attacks and push their chests, CPR, but he did not know how to do it, and in, in any case, he could not do it with the pilot who was sitting up in the seat and still strapped in with his seatbelt. So he touched the pilot with the tips of his fingers touched him on the chest and could feel nothing. No heartbeat, no rise and fall of breathing, which meant that the pilot was almost certainly dead. Please, Brian said, but did not know what or to whom to ask. Please. The plane lurched again, hit more turbulence, and Brian felt the nose dip. It did not dive, but the nose went down slightly, and the down angle increased the speed, and he knew that at this angle, this slight angle down, he would ultimately fly into the trees. He could see them ahead on the horizon, where before he could see only sky. He had to fly it somehow. Had to fly the plane. Had to help himself. The pilot was gone, beyond anything he could do. He had to try and fly the plane. He turned back in the seat, facing the front, and put his hands, still trembling, on the control wheel, his feet gently on the rudder pedals. You pulled back on the stick to raise the plane. He knew that from reading. You always pulled back on the wheel. He gave it a tug, and it slid back toward him easily. Too easily. The plane, with the increased speed from the tilt down, had pushed the, uh, wait, swooped eagerly up and drove Brian's stomach down. He pushed the wheel back in, went too far this time, and the plane's nose went below the horizon, and the engine speed increased with the shallow dive. Too much. He pulled back again, more gently this time. The nose floated up again. Too far, but not as violently as before. Then down a bit too much, and up again, as before. Then down a bit too much, and up again, very easily, and the front engine cowling settled. When he had it aimed at the horizon and it seemed to be steady, he held the wheel where it was, let out his breath, which he had been holding all this time, and tried to think what to do next. It was a clear blue sky day with fluffy bits of clouds here and there, and he looked out of the window for a moment, hoping to see something, a town or village, but there was nothing, just the green of the trees, endless green and lakes scattered more and more thickly as the plane flew. Where? He was flying, but did not know where, had no idea where he was going. He looked at the dashboard of the plane, studied the dials, and hoped to get some help, hoped to find a compass. But it was all so confusing, a jumble of numbers and lights. One lighted display in the top center of the dashboard said the number 342. Another next to it said 22. Down beneath what that were dials with lines that seemed to indicate what the winds were doing, tipping or moving, and one dial with a needle pointing to the number 70, which he thought, only thought, might be the altimeter. 
The device had told him his height above the ground, or above sea level. Somewhere he had read something about altimeters, but he couldn't remember what, or where, or anything about them. Slightly to the left and below the altimeter, he saw a small rectangular panel with a lighted dial and two knobs. His eyes had passed it over two or three times before he saw what was written in tiny letters on top of the panel. Transmitter 221 was stamped in in the metal, and it hit him, finally, that this was the radio. The radio. Of course, he had to use the radio. When the pilot had had been hit that way, he couldn't bring himself to say that the pilot was dead. Couldn't think it. He had been trying to use the radio. Brian looked at the pilot. The headset was still on his head, turned sideways a bit from his jamming back into the seat, and the microphone switch was clipped into his belt. Brian had to get the headset from the pilot. He had to reach over and get the headset from the pilot or he would not be able to use the radio to call for help. He had to reach over. His hands began trembling again. He did not want to touch the pilot, did not want to reach for him. But he had to, had to get the radio. He lifted his hands from the wheel just slightly and held them waiting to see what would happen. The plane flew on normally, smoothly. All right, he thought. Now, now to do this thing. He turned and reached for the headset. It slid from the pilot's head, one eye on the plane, waiting for it to dive. The headset came easily, but the microphone switch at the pilot's belt was jammed in, and he had to pull to get it loose. When he pulled, his elbow bumped the wheel and pushed it in, and the plane started down in a shallow dive. Brian grabbed the wheel and pulled it back, too hard again, and the plane went through another series of stomach-wrenching swoops up and down before he could get it under control. When things had settled again, he pulled at the mic cord once more and at last jerked the cord free. It took him another second or two to place the headset on his own head and position the small microphone tube in front of his mouth. He had seen the pilot use it, had seen him depress the switch at his belt, so Brian pushed the switch in and blew into the mic. He heard the sound of his breath in the headset. Hello? Is there anybody listening to this? Hello? He repeated it two or three times and then waited, but heard nothing except his own breathing. Panic came then. He had been afraid. He had been stopped with the terror of what was happening. But now panic came, and he began to scream into the microphone. Scream over and over. Help! Somebody help me! I'm in this plane, and don't know! Don't know! Don't know! He started crying with the screams, crying and slamming his hands against the wheel of the plane, causing it to jerk down, then back up. But again, he heard nothing but the sound of his own sobs in the microphone, his own screams mocking him, coming back into his ears. The microphone. Awareness cut into him. He had used a CB radio on his uncle's pickup once. You had to turn the mic switch off to hear anybody else. He reached to his belt and released the switch. For a second, all he heard was the whoosh of empty airwaves. Then... Through the noise and static, he heard a voice. Whoever is calling on this radio net, I repeat, release your mic switch. You are covering me. You are covering me. Over. It stopped, and Brian hit his mic switch. I hear you. I hear you. This is me. He released the switch. Roger, I have you now. The voice was very faint and breaking up. Please state your difficulty and location and say over to signal the end of transmission. Over. Please state my difficulty, Brian thought. God, my difficulty. I'm in a plane with a pilot who is... He can't fly, and I don't know how to fly. Help me, help! He turned his mic off without ending the transmission properly. There was a moment's hesitation before the answer. Your signal is breaking up. I lost most of it. Understand? Pilot, you can't fly. Correct? Over. Brian could barely hear him now, heard mostly noise and static. That's right. 
I can't fly. The plane is flying now, but I don't know how much longer. Over. Lost signal. Your location, please. Flight number. Location. For. I don't know my flight number or location. I don't know anything. I told you that. Over. He waited now. Waited. But there was nothing. Once, for a second, he thought he heard a break in the noise. Some part of a word. But it had to have been, could have been static. Two. Three minutes. Ten minutes. The plane roared. And Brian listened, but heard no one. Then he hit the switch again. I do not know my flight number. My name is Brian Robeson, and we left Hampton, New York, headed for the Canadian oil fields to visit my father, and I do not know how to fly an airplane. And the pilot... He let go of his mic. His voice was starting to rattle, and he felt as if he might start screaming at any second. He took a deep breath. (sighs) If there is anybody listening who can help me fly a plane, please answer. Again, he released the mic, but heard nothing but the hissing of noise in the headset. About half an hour of listening and repeating the cry for help. After that, after half an hour of listening and repeating the cry for help, he tore the headset off in frustration and threw it to the floor. It all seemed so hopeless. Even if he did get somebody, what could anybody do? Tell him to be careful? All so hopeless. He tried to figure out the dials again. He thought he might know which was speed. It was a lighted number that read 160, but he didn't know if it was actual miles an hour or kilometers or if it just meant how fast the plane was moving through the air and not over the ground. He knew airspeed was different from ground speed, but not by how much. Parts of books he read about flying came to him. How wings worked, how the propeller pulled the plane through the sky. Simple things that wouldn't help him now. Nothing could help him now. An hour passed. He picked up the headset and tried again. It was, he knew, in the end, all he had. But there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner, kept in a small cell that was hurtling through the sky at what he thought to be 160 miles an hour, headed, he didn't know where, just headed somewhere, until there it was. Until what? Until he ran out of fuel. When the plane ran out of fuel, it would go down. Period. Or he could pull the throttle out and make it go down now. He had seen the pilot push the throttle in to increase speed. If he pulled the throttle back out, the engine would slow down and the plane would go down. Those were his choices. He could wait for the plane to run out of gas and fall, or he could push the throttle in and make it happen sooner. If he waited for the plane to run out of fuel, he would go farther, but he did not know which way he was moving. When the pilot had jerked, he had moved the plane, but Brian could not remember how much of it, how much or or if it had come back to its original course. Since he did not know the original course anyway and could only guess at which display might be the compass, the one reading 342, He did not know where he had been or where he was going, so it didn't make much difference if he went down now or waited. I kind of agree, and also it's like, who knows, maybe if you keep going you'll see a town or an open field or something like that. I mean, I just think your your desire for optimism would say, I just got to keep going and hope that the scenery changes, perhaps. And also, who who could willingly, let alone a 13-year-old boy never been in this situation before, make a conscious decision to say, I'm going to send myself down? Like, when I really don't know how to land this plane. Everything in... Well, here we go. Everything in him rebelled against the stopping... The Excuse me. Everything in him rebelled against stopping the engine and falling now. He had a vague feeling that he was wrong to keep heading as the plane was heading. A feeling that he might be going off in the wrong direction. I'm sure we would all potentially be thinking that. But he could not bring himself to stop the engine and fall. I really don't blame him for that, you know. Now... He was safe, or safer than if he went down. The plane was flying. He was still breathing. When the engine stopped, he would go down. So he left the plane running, holding altitude, and kept trying the radio. He worked out a system, 
Every ten minutes, by the small clock built into the dashboard, he tried to radio with a simple message. I need help. Is, any, is there anybody listening to me? In the times between transmissions, he tried to prepare himself for what he knew was coming. When he ran out of fuel, the plane would start down. He guessed that without the propeller pulling, he would have to push the nose down to keep the plane flying. He thought he may have read that somewhere. He thought he may have read that somewhere, or it just came to him. Either way, it made sense. He would have to push the nose down to keep flying speed, and then, just before he hit, he would have to pull the nose back up to slow the plane as much as possible. It all made sense. Glide down, then slow the plane, and hit. Hit. He would have to find a clearing as he went down. The problem with that was he hadn't seen one clearing since they started flying over the forest. Some swamps, but they had trees scattered through them. No roads, no trails, no clearings. Just the lakes. And it came to him that he would have to use a lake for landing. If he went down in the trees, he was certain to die. The trees would tear the plane to pieces as it went into them. He would have to come down in a lake. No, on the edge of a lake. He would have to come down near the edge of a lake and try to slow the plane as much as possible just before he hit the water. Easy to say, he thought. Hard to do. Easy say, hard do. Easy say, hard do. It became a chant that beat with the engine. Easy say, hard do. Impossible to do. He repeated the radio call 17 times at 10-minute intervals, working on what he would do between transmissions. Once more, he reached over to the pilot and touched him on the face, but the skin was cold, hard cold, death cold, and Brian turned back to the dashboard. He did what he could, tightened his seatbelt, positioned himself, rehearsed mentally again and again what his procedure should be. When the plane ran out of gas, he should hold the nose down and head for the nearest lake and try to fly the plane kind of onto the water. That's how he thought of it. Kind of fly the plane onto the water. And just before it hit, he should pull back on the wheel and slow the plane to reduce the impact. Over and over, his mind ran the picture of how it would go. The plane running out of gas, flying the plane onto the water, the crash from pictures he'd seen on television. He tried to visualize it. He tried to be ready. But between the 17th and 18th radio transmissions, without a warning, the engine coughed, roared violently for a second, and died. There was a sudden silence, cut only by the sound of the windmilling propeller and the wind past the cockpit. <sighs> Brian pushed the nose of the plane down and threw up. So, wow, the great scary moment of of delivery, of, of deliverance, if you will. His, his crucible has come. Now we continue on to chapter three, where Brian will attempt to land the plane as a 13-year-old out on the edge of a lake for the first time ever with a dead pilot sitting next to him. Unbelievable stuff. Stick with me. Feel free to subscribe so you get instant alerts. Drop me a comment. Let me know how I'm doing on reading this one. What you like me to read next? And we will continue on our next video. Thanks.